pleasure to introduce Zach Wright as our guest for today's episode. Zach is an experienced risk manager at the Haskell Company. The Haskell Company is a large construction organization with over 2,000 professionals. Zach is a certified construction risk and insurance specialist who knows his stuff. This was a really great conversation. It's a follow-up from the RIMS conference. Let's get to it. Hello, Zach. How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Thank you for joining me on Brick by Brick. I'm excited to catch up with you. Uh, we were at uh, we were at what conference were we at? We were at Global Global Rims. Global no, Rims, Rims, Rims 2023. I did a lot of interviews at, uh, and then we missed our chance to to talk. So I guess the first question I have for you before we get started is what did you learn at Rims? What was what was the what was the the mood? What was the what was the vibe about? Insurance is volatile right now, especially being in construction, we do a lot of property style um, policies and boy, there, there's something else right now, especially, you know, we're, we're based out of Florida. We do probably 50% of our work in Florida. So we are definitely um, challenged by so, the state of the property market. So insurance is volatile. It's on all the minds of risk managers. We'll jump into all of that, but to get everyone started, why don't you give uh, the uh, 40,000 foot view of your career and how you ended up in that chair with all those Star Wars figures behind you? Sure. Uh, so I uh, joined the Haskell team here uh, a little bit over seven years ago. Uh, prior to risk management, I was a techie. I did audio and visual aids for uh, my church here in, in Jacksonville. So um, I have a little bit of a background in underwriting uh, from Many moons ago, I did some uh, freelance underwriting for a friend of the family. Um, so I kind of had a baseline risk management view, but yeah. uh, I've learned quite a bit here uh, in the seven plus years here at Haskell. What's, uh, if you had to talk about, you know, where your risk management views are now and what you view are the major components of the job, how would you break that down? Sure. So my biggest, uh, job function here is I control our, our builder's risk program, which is our property for all of our projects. Um, I, I handle our bonding needs uh, for surety bonds and as well as our work comp. So I'm pretty much from the operation side, right? I, I like to handle the day-to-day. -day. I'm the one that gets dirty with the project teams to make sure all the insurance is in place and, and make sure that our guys are covered, you know, when they go to the site, because, you know, at Haskell here, safety is is our, our, big, our big push you know, just with any construction company, but, you know, we, we take it a step further with how we protect our, not only our clients, but, you know, our team members here, you know, our subcontractors, you know, anybody that sets foot on one of our sites, we want to make sure that, you know, they have the best coverage and they're covered for anything that happens. And so that looks like uh, working with your vendors, working with your subcontractors to make sure that they also understand the insurance requirements and that they're getting the support they need does it look like uh, obviously developing procedures uh, in order to uh, accept the risk that you are taking on those jobs? Do you guys have a process? So one of my favorite frameworks is governance, which is the team commits to having the conversation about uh, new incoming risks. And that can be made up of you and you know, maybe executives, however that works within your organization. Then that goes down to evaluation of your risk appetite. Are we going to take on this risk? Are we going to mitigate this risk? Are we going to pass this risk off? And then it flows into policy procedures or uh, contractual risk transfer if you're going to pass it down to your subcontractors. That's a very sophisticated way of looking at it. How do you then go and educate this, the vendors or even your own teammates about these processes? What, what, what sort of field processes do you have? Yeah, so I think the big thing that we do here is we do training, right? Every six months, I'm, I'm meeting with project teams. Um, you know, going over emerging risk, right? Like, so two of the big ones that we've seen in the last five years are cyber and drug. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, educate them on the risks associated with, you know, say, you know, Joe's, John Smith has his drone, he wants to bring it and takes a picture of the job site. Well, here's a risk if you have somebody that brings a personal drone to the site, right? Like, yeah, you're, you're at risk of putting yourself in danger as well as putting, you know, the company, some contractors, anybody on that site. So our biggest thing is training, right? And yeah. we harp on it. Um, with COVID, you know, we, we've kind of switched to the team Zoom style meetings um, for training. I think it's easier for us to get everybody together that way. But uh, we're always 
uh, educating them on emerging risk. Uh, if things change within our own insurance portfolio, uh, as soon as they change, we let them know. We like, look, here's how this is going to affect you. This is how it can affect your subcontractors. Um, the other thing we do is, you know, we're a relatively small risk management team here. There's, you know, there's only three of us. Mm -hmm. So we, we all know everything that happens within our risk management team. So any team member can come to any one of us and say, Hey, I got a question about this and they'll be able to help them or we can get together as a team and help. So How we're really, you... oh, we're really customer focused, right? And our customer in risk management is not necessarily just vendors. It's, it's our teammates. Right. Yeah, it's the ones who are, who are putting everything together. So how do you give that initial? So do you guys have risk? Do you guys have a standard contract or by vendor or whatever is necessary for that particular job? Do you grade and then give a risk assessment of what needs to be mitigated? So I, what I guess what I'm getting at is, do you fall into the camp where you have low, uh, mid, high risk, and then you have different requirements for those? Or is everything bespoke in the way that you guys operate? So uh, the way that we run is we have a separate pre-qual team that does all of the pre-qualification, which assesses the initial risk, right, before we even touch it. Now, we've trained our pre-qualification team members, right, to uh, if they see something out of the ordinary, on the risk profile, on the insurance side, on the bonding side, anything like that, come to us because we're the lot, we're the one-stop shop for it, right? So if there's an issue with somebody who maybe doesn't have an insurance coverage, or you know maybe their ratings for their recordable injury rate is not as good, then you know we work through it with them, um, and that's that's really how we we protect ourselves in the beginning, right? We also have. Um, five or six different styles of contracts, depending on the work being done, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't just have a one, one size fits all contract because not every contractor is one size fits all. Um, yeah, and that, I mean, mention, obviously reduces the contractors you can use and everything else. Which absolutely. Is not, that's part of that risk profile is, is actually looking at the job and putting it into a category that then you can actually facilitate and be successful at. Yeah, and you know, Haskell is a little bit unique. We are a full service design build firm. So we can take a project from start to finish, from design, we have agreements for professional services all the way through our construction. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of unique. So we kind of have to have that model of, you have to have a contract that fits the scope of work that's going on, correct? So that, that's, that's our second kind of form of risk transfer. We also have an in-house legal team who reviews uh, prime contracts with owners and review some contracts with our vendors to make sure that any a contractual risk transfer is being properly identified and passed through if need be. So, I mean, we have very many layers of how we protect not only our owners, but Haskell as a whole and our subcontractors to make sure our subcontractors, you know, are able to number one, perform the work and number two, do it safely yeah. because it's all about safety. It's all about, you know, saving that, that person's life on the job site, you know, just because you had the right procedures in place. Absolutely. And also, you know, like I, I always talk about the built world and how, you know, the job is to add to the world and get that work done. Obviously, businesses are designed to make profits, but in reality, everybody wants a positive outcome uh, across the board. And I think that's the biggest thing that I found with risk managers and their philosophies of how do I become proactive where my team will share information with me versus looking at me as a uh, as a human stop sign within the organization? How do I get my project managers or even my vendors to share risk? And how do I change the perception of what risk management used to be, which is we're going to reduce cost to no, we actually want to know this stuff because if we can, if we can handle X successfully, then that opens doors for us um, versus just saying no to everything. So talk about that journey since you've been around in the field for a while now and, and, and where you guys are at with that today. So it's funny you mentioned that. So when I joined um, back in 2016, risk management, we were the no people, right? We were the ones that nobody wanted to talk to us because if they talked to us, they they felt like they had done something wrong and we were there to either slap their wrist or tell them, you know, they're not doing it right. Yeah. Um, over the years, the philosophy's changed, right? We've grown just like a lot of construction companies and we've really shifted the focus from us being the no people to us being your first line of defense. So if something goes wrong, we're not here to tell you what you did wrong. 
we're here to make sure that you get through that in the best outcome possible. Right. Mitigate so we, from we, this point forward, basically. Correct. Correct. Everybody, we're human. We're, we're going to make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. It's going to happen, but it's how you can mitigate that loss. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the best mitigation is to be proactive, not to be reactive. And, and for a long time, risk management here was very reactive. So uh, we've really encouraged our project teams to, you know, if they see a problem on the horizon, reach out to us as early as you can. You know, we're, we're here to help. We're not here to be a deterrent. We're here to help. And that's where a lot of people don't understand where risk management it really is today, especially mm -hmm. in the construction world. We're not there, not there to just be. Stop the who, work, essentially. Correct. Correct. The work has to continue. We understand that. But we're here to make sure that the work is continuing safely. And if any issues arise, we'll help you through it because that's what that's what we're here for. We're here to serve serve our customers. Right. We're not here to be the big bad guy that tells you no. A uh, controversial topic sometimes is in risk management, you have what I'll call a modern view of risk management. And people can correct me if I'm they, they can throw tomatoes at me if they want, which is that. Um, COI tracking, actually validating the insurance information that is part of the contract is closing the loop on a process that starts in the prequal, in the you know, in selecting the vendor, in the contract signing, and it's a, a pivotal part. And then there's some risk managers who go, well, it's in the contract, so if something happens, we can just litigate against the contract. We don't really care about the COI or knowing if they're compliant. What's your take on that, and how do you manage that within your own teams? All right. So yes, very controversial. Uh, when I started here, uh, COIs were anything and everything for us, right? Yeah. Uh, to get paid, you had to have COI. When the project closed, you had to have COI. Uh, when they were within their statute of limitations of complete operations, had to see the COI every year. What we've kind of adopted now is yes, the COI is important. It's very important because like you said, from start to finish, pre, pre qualification. Let me start over. Pre qualification. We ask, can you meet our limits? Now, sometimes they don't even know what those limits are and they right. just click yes. And then we get to the contract and they're like, oh, well, we can't provide that. So, what we tell our teams is look, if you have issues with a subcontractor that they can't provide something, come to us. We have solutions mm -hmm. to help not only mitigate any risk associated with not having a certain part of the coverage, but to get things flowing forward. Because the last thing we need, especially in this day and age, is to have a contract where you have a vendor that you have to have, number one. Uh, number two, maybe has long lead supply chain issues right. to get behind. So, And we all tie that back into the COI. Mm -hmm. So we don't normally require COIs during pre-qualification, but before a contractor steps on site, we're asking for their COI. Uh, we have uh, one of my team members on our team. That's her job function. One of them is that she reviews COIs. Mm -hmm. and, but that also goes back to training, right? We've trained our team members what to look for. We are not the ones that are just going to come launch, look at a COI mm -hmm. from top to bottom. Uh, we've created you know, uh, certain help documents that shows, hey, look, here's our contracts. Here's what's required. If something doesn't make sense to you, please reach out to us. We'll walk you through it. But yeah. we're giving them the tools to succeed ahead of time. Yeah, I think that's important. When right. I also think about taking that one step further and, and talking about different processes, um, as it's becoming an issue, and this was something that I heard uh, at RIMS, where your contractor pool and maybe even your direct employee pool is shrinking – because the industry across almost all are shrinking in trade craft professions that you must develop a stronger relationship with your with your contractors with your employees as an organization and thus it becomes like almost an extension of your team and i i know that every construction company will say that their contractors are an extension of their team um, but like people are actually going out and now, you know, providing training or doing forced coverage for their providers or looking at how many endorsements, like how many endorsements did we waive? How much, how much, did we, how much risk did we accept? So I guess the question I have one is how do you keep track of all your risk appetite? How do you take and put in, put in front of 
your executive team and go, this is, these are the things we opened ourselves up to for risk. These are the things that we shut down. Like, do you have a cadence like that? Is that part of your process? Is it part of the process that you're thinking about implementing in the future? Where would you like to see that process go? So here at Haskell, we were kind of unique. So we require uh, waivers if somebody can't meet the limits. And those have to be signed by one of our directors of construction. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're telling them, look, here's the risk. They'll come to us and say, hey, I have, an, I have a waiver that's been put on my desk. Can you tell me what the risk is? Sure. And we'll lay it out for them. I mean, it could be something simple as they're a couple hundred thousand dollars short on the coverage. And I'm like, look, I mean, it's a $50,000 contract being a couple hundred thousand short of a $4 million limit or whatever it is. Not a big deal. Yeah. But then there's some who are like, well, we have this contractor who says they don't care professional, yet they're providing design services. Yeah. Well, that's a big deal. Yeah. So, uh, but the waiver is our way of making sure that they reach out to us and mm -hmm. say, here's what we, here's what we have. And here's what we're thinking of waiving. Can you give me your blessing on it? Number one, or can you tell me what risk we're taking if we, if we do go through with it? Mm -hmm. So uh, we tried to make, let our project teams make their own decisions. But like I said, we're here to, to serve them as a customer. Well, that's really so we, interesting because the way you guys do it is there's accountability, but also flexibility. So Correct. You're, 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 uh, everyone is incentivized to expose the risk for, for a conversation to occur. And then it's uh, an authoritative decision. Are we approving this or not? And it's not just made within the risk department. So, you know, I think that's a really smart order of procedure there. Yeah, it's really, and it's good too, because like you said, the, all the authority is not on one person. It's a team effort, right? Mm -hmm. So we can only advise on what the risk is. We can't go out there and, and stop the risk ourselves. So, but it's our job to make sure that they're uh, knowledgeable about the risk that they're about to take if they approve it. So, and also, I mean, we don't want to be the ones that we waive something, then we have a claim. Well, risk management said it was fine. No, I told you, here's what would happen if you did it and you went through with it. You could have denied it and made them get the coverage. Right. So, yeah. Um, that also leads to another thing that's become popular in, in conversation usually behind closed doors. And I like to, on the podcast, try to have these conversations out in the open, which is the idea that um, as far as like uh, organizations go, like a lot of organizations and risk management teams and their executives don't really have any visibility into what's being waived or what's being, what's being done. So it sounds like you've solved that problem. But then the secondary problem is they're doing all this work and it has very little impact on their premiums when they renew their insurance. Like, you know, you could have technology for tracking COIs, you could have all, all these different elements in your organization, and yet it's not reducing or, or preventing your insurance mm -hmm. premiums from raising every year. And, you know, there's now talk and thought that like, oh, organizations that do have their act together, that are showing that they have clear processes and XYZ should be considered uh, for at least a discount in their insurance premiums going up, or there has to be some outcome that's beneficial for organizations across the board. Do you agree? Do you Are you able to influence your insurance renewals uh, successfully with your, with your processes and programs? So I agree. If you are, number one, let's start from the broad picture, right? Construction technology helps mitigate so many risks nowadays compared to just five years ago in this yeah. industry. Right. So, for instance, we have telematics for our vehicles. We don't have a really big fleet, uh, but we have it. And it's a good tool for us because if there's an accident, we have ways that we can mitigate risk. Well, we've approached our carrier about it and they're like, no, nah, it's really it's everybody's doing it. So there's no reason to give any discounts Yeah, because right. everybody's doing it. They're they're more along the lines of thinking, well, this is mandatory at this point. Yep. If you don't have it, then I'm probably going to raise your rates, right? Right. I'm not going to give you any kind of discount. So that's where I'm seeing it a lot. Um, and I'm seeing that a lot in the cyber. But cyber, I am starting to see if you have certain things in place, you will get some reduction in premium. Yeah. Um, we've, we've been fortunate enough to have that this year. We have some really uh, knowledgeable, great IT team members here that have really put some good uh, foundations in place. And our, our cyber carrier took notice of it. Yeah. No, but I think I think you see it on both sides, right? You'll see the things that everybody's doing, and if everybody's doing it, 
then you're not going to see that. Well, is that because the cyber providers are typically because there's only, you know, a handful of really great ones out there, but they're more modern in the, in their approach and what they're actually looking for. So they want those data points in order to give the best premiums and be competitive where maybe our traditional insurance companies don't really have the incentive to, incentive to be competitive because they know that you're in this region and you use them or this guy and it's going to be the same pricing kind of no matter what. I often wonder if this whole thing in the certain industries get this bad rap for not adapting technology. Your background's in a technologist, so this is why I feel uh, compelled to ask this question to you. And where it's like, well, no, technology only uh, thrives in organizations where the output of the technology is understood and, and utilized. And if the insurance companies are not really going to be looking at this in their underwriting process, then you can put all the technology in the world in place, but it's not going to have the outcome that you need in order to really invest the processes and procedures in that technology. And, and you know, I think that the industry is changing. I do think that there has, is positive signs that the industry, both on the insurance side and within construction and property management, and other more slow to adopt industries, so to speak, of technology are now seeing that those technologies are being considered. Now, the question is, you have so much data, what can we do with that data in order to benefit the entire ecosystem, which might be reducing premiums, might be introducing new products, might be whatever it might be. But ultimately, I see that it, it has to be full, it has to be full cycle. And I've yeah. seen that construction industry adopt technologies at a rapid rate right now, because this conversation is at least occurring. Correct. And, you know, uh, Haskell has uh, an R&D wing, uh, Disrupt Tech, right? And, I mean, the way I see it is we may not get premium reduction, but with the technology that we're implementing and how, you know, modern and state-of-the-art it is, mm -hmm. our savings are coming on the other end, right? We're reducing the, the, the volume of claims, number one. We're reducing the severity of claims, number two. So I, I look at it as a kind of a checks and balances, right? Well, we may not get that premium reduction up front that we want to see, mm -hmm. but if we can save one or two claims, claims a year, claims are gonna go yeah, yeah, right. You're gonna you're gonna see both sides of it, yeah, and you're gonna see something that is positive. So we're and like I said, we're very and I mean we really strive in R and D. Uh, our team's fantastic, and we're constantly rolling things out to project teams. We're piling things on job sites, uh, anything from hard hats to, you know, robotics. Um, so it's, you know, it's good for us because it keeps us safe, but it's also good for the industry because I think the industry needs to see that technology is the way of the future to help build because yeah. you still have a lot who are the this old school, just, you know, technology is is not going to help you. Where it's it's very much a very good number one deterrent for possible injuries and claims, but number two, it's also efficient. Right, absolutely. Uh, it's been really good talking to you. I, I like that we've been able to cover so much. One last question I have for you is around advice for people in, the, in entering the industry because another big thing at rims was all around how there's an aging risk management population and we need to get modern risk managers into the field entice them in and then there was a good number of youngish you know in their mid-20s mm -hmm. risk managers or risk analysts what piece of advice would you have in order to have a long fruitful career both in this and maybe in in general so what i like to tell you know, younger risk managers is this. Risk management is a very broad field. Um, I would say knowledge is, is power in this case. Um, don't pinch and hold yourself into one area if you can, number one. Number two, network. Network, uh, that's the biggest thing I've learned in seven years in risk management. The risk management field is not a big field. So it's good to have those relationships to help you grow. Mm -hmm. And then number three is just, you know, really just dive into what you're doing. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Learn from your mentors as much as you can. Soak all the knowledge you can when you're young, because I promise you it's beneficial in the long run. Yeah, I think your point two and point three go. So the biggest thing I've noticed is everyone says network's important in all industries and technology where I come from, of course you're networking. Uh, oftentimes you're trying to sell someone when you're, when you're also networking. What I find that's interesting about risk management is it's a body like sort of professors 
where if we share knowledge in risk management, everybody gets better and that's better for everyone in the industry. And so it really is networking leads to mentorship, right? Uh, I found that so many people have been willing to step up and fill in the gaps and share information with me that uh, is really unique that you don't get in every single profession, right? Um, right. And in that way, I find it to be a very, um, all you have to do is be curious and lean in and there'll be people there that want to support you through that process and and make you the best that they can possibly be because they have a passion for it. Yeah, and I mean, I had uh, our previous uh, director of risk management here was a great mentor to me. Uh, she taught me how to do things. And then our current director, he's been here almost three years. And I mean, uh, leaps and bounds of the, just the things I've learned, just soaking it up, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not old by any stretch of imagination, but I mean, I've learned so much in the last two and a half years under his, under his guide and, and mentorship. It's, it's, it's just, it's fascinating. Risk management is a fascinating world. You're never going to see the same thing twice. That's every, right. every challenge is going to be different. Absolutely. So, well, thank you so much, Zach, for joining me on Brick by Brick. It was a fascinating and awesome conversation, and I look forward to catching up at another conference. Awesome. Thanks, Jason, for having me. Thank you. Peace, man.